So, Jill, shall we start? Yes, uh, let's get started. Okay, great. So, well, warm welcome from me. I'm Oliver. I'm together with my colleague Hakim, um, who is also whom you also see right now. Um, we are representing IB Tech Lab in, in Europe, and since this webinar is part of a global series, and we are, um, we are, we have been trying to adjust to local and regional compatible time zones. Um, this is the third webinar about getting started with open measurement for web video. Um, and it's in a, obviously in a European friendly time zone, time zone and uh, um, glad to, ha to have you all here. Um, we'll have a couple of speakers um, on the webinar from, so to speak, from the heart of the working group who has been um, spent uh, lots of time to develop um, OMSDK for web video standards. Um, and uh, such as the speakers are Saar Pamoni, VP Product Management at Double Verify, Jack Wellborn, Senior Staff Engineer at Integral Ad Science, John Saterfield from Oracle's Mode, and Nick Chavez, Senior Software Engineer at Google. Um, th those are really um, have been have been helped us a lot um, as Tech Lab Working Group to develop uh, the new standard and, and to actually have been part of the so-called Tech Lab Comet Group as well. Um, I'm Oliver, you can see me now. Um, with me from Ivy Tech Lab, um, from the core team are Jared, um, Director of Compliance, Jill, Director of Product, and later on for the Q&A, we'll also have uh, Shaley, um, who is VP Product, and I, likely you can see him as well right now in the video, at least with his picture. So what are we intending to do now? Um, here you see the agenda. Um, just two housekeeping notes in advance. So this will be recorded, as um, many of the webinars we we are we are uh, doing. Um, so you will be able to access the recording later and distribute it wherever needed. And second, um, please, whenever um, applicable, whenever you have a question, use the Q and A box in in, in your Zoom client, um, and you can use it at, at any point of time. So in the end, we will have time for your questions and and for a discussion. But uh, um, use the Q and A throughout. We are presenting, and we will make sure that we can, that we are on track on on answering your questions. So first, we'll intro on what is open measurement. What is the open measurement framework? We dive then into open measurement for web video. What are the features? We give an, we'll give an, um, a technical integration overview. Um, we'll talk a bit about the different access modes um, OM SDK for web video has, about domain access validation and uh, certification testing requirements um, for the different, uh, the, the different suppliers and the different companies who can implement OM SDK for web video into their environment. And finally, we will end up with a Q&A. As mentioned, please feel free to, to place your question throughout the presentation. So next slide, please. If you don't know Tech Lab yet, you have registered to, a, to an IAB Tech Lab webinar session. Our mission is as a nonprofit organization to develop uh, with, with our global member community foundational technology standards and enable growth and trust in the digital me media ecosystem. Um, so we are, uh, we are about develop, developing technical standards for the online advertising ecosystem, uh, maintaining those standards and ensuring compliance for the standards. And with that, we, we do that with a member-driven approach. Um, Tech Lab has approximately 800 members worldwide, um, growing in other regions um, outside of the US, 10% approximately um, membership base in Europe. But of course, a lot of global companies are part of Tech Lab and are supporting our mission. Um, and if you look in, if you can move to the next slide, if you do look at um, what we are doing, some of the standards very likely have been have been on your desk in your in your inbox and it probably are part of your tech stack. If you look at ads.txt and sellers.json to make sure that uh, that uh, you can get uh, tra transparency and combat ad fraud in a technical way. OMSDK, we will talk about that in a minute, but also TCF Europe um, uh, in co strong cooperation with IAB Europe um, as a standard for ensuring GDPR compliance on the tracking side is is something which uh, which Tech Lab maintains technically. You see a couple of other standards. Um, that that is that is what we are doing. And in this case, and now I hand over to, I guess, to you, Jill, 
we are um, we are talking about open measurement SDK for web video. And now over to to you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, so I am going to uh, queue up a video here. We do have, since we are working uh, towards that global scale, some of our experts are in uh, different regions. So please forgive me. I have a few uh, recordings of their um, overviews. So Star is going to provide an overview video of the history of OMSDK and the features of OM for web video. Hi, I'm Sar from Double Verify. I'd like to talk to you about what is o Open Measurement SDK, um, a little bit about its adoption and the new features coming up with Open Measurement for web video. So first we'll start with some history. Uh, back before 2017, uh, measurement providers such as Double Verify have uh, been building their own proprietary mobile app SDKs to perform advertising measurement. Predominantly uh, impression counting and viewability were the metrics that uh, we built those SDKs to uh, measure. Um, this was a big undertaking, a lot of resources and effort in uh, keeping them up to date and uh, progressing as OS is updated. Uh, it also caused a lot of issues for app developers who had to integrate these SDKs, keep them up to date, and a lot of times up integrate more than one SDK by one vendor. Um, and the outcome in the marketplace wasn't great either. It caused reduced measurement rate, issues with accuracy, issues with coverage of those solutions, and generally consistency of measurement across different vendors wasn't great. Um, and, you know, to get an SDK like that in market and get sufficient ramp up and then not have holes in your coverage was, was really, really challenging. So, uh, you know, in 2017, the IAB, IAB Tech Lab has uh, basically opened the open measurement working group, um, you know, ourselves and all the other verification companies have banded together to create uh, this unified uh, purpose-built solution for viewability measurement. Um, and we have uh, released it in market and get a lot of adoption with it. Um, as you can see, uh, you know, a lot of big name companies here. This is a sample. The full list could be found on the IAB Tech Lab website. There's about 80 certified uh, apps and uh, ads SDKs um, that went through the rigor of the IAB uh, testing um, uh, process and have been certified for their integration. Um, I think we'll discuss the certifications at length later in this uh, webinar. Um, you know, some data from Double Verify uh, about the adoption. This is a comparison of Q4 2020 to Q4 2019. Um, we've seen growth of 346% on video, 117% uh, on AMID uh, for display advertising, and about 900,000 unique apps uh, that had uh, ads that we, we measured with OM SDK. So um, definitely deep adoption. We've seen growth, uh, uh, three-digit growth in every quarter over quarter number that we have done since the OM was launched. Uh, so this is an ongoing uh, kind of a scale pro, uh, success story. Um, we're very pleased uh, by it. Uh, the measurement has been very consistent and uh, I'm sure other vendors have seen kind of the same, about the same numbers. Um, so kind of switching gears, this is a road of OM SDK. Basically uh, we have started with Android and iOS. Those were the pressing issues. Uh, and you know, back in the 
when when the group started uh we have launched them got a lot of adoption as as i showed earlier um in december of 2020 we have announced the release of om sdk for web video um and we're currently in the process of scoping out and and writing requirements working towards the future development of connected tv solution um so getting into the web video uh, SDK, uh, basically this is packed with features that are video specific and web use case specific. Um, we now support friendly obstruction. So if you cover the player on your website, if you're a publisher and you, you know, happen to cover your player with some transparent div, div to, to capture events, which we've seen quite often in the marketplace, you can declare that as a friendly obstruction and OM would consider that in its viewability calculations. Uh, there's full support for both VAST and DAST event. Uh, while, while DAST is being kind of deprecated and merged into VAST at, uh, uh, on the VAST 4 uh, standard those events that are audio specific are supported within uh, Ahmed uh, for web um, player volume device volume are now supported um, you know big progress on the measurement of impression in compliance with the MRC definition of begin to render uh, now basically there's an impression type uh, uh, attribute on the session start uh, event, which um, the integrator is able to state exactly with what what point in time they are uh, de declaring this as an impression. This is critical for compliance with MRC guidelines. Um, support declaration of page content URLs. Uh, really important for contextuality and brand safety use cases. Um, and, you know, kind of uh, the, the, the uh, one more step towards replacing vPaid. Uh, so, you know, maybe to take a minute and just talk about vPaid and how OM is replacing it over time. The history of video web measurement is basically that to measure viewability in the marketplace you know until this sdk you as a measurement vendor had to kind of choose one of two paths or, or i guess both of them depending on the website uh, one is to uh, have a library that you provide that site that performs measurement but more commonly you would use vPaid as an in-between ad manager that is able to capture all the necessary events and also inject the measurement script on the page. Uh, now, vPaid was not built for viewability measurement. Uh, and a lot of people in the marketplace interpret vPaid and viewability as kind of uh, two sides of the same coin. That's because that was kind of the only tool that was very available at large scale in the marketplace to measure viewability on video. Uh, ON for web is coming now to kind of replace that. Um, I, we know a lot of publishers, a lot of supply platforms uh, don't like vPaid. Uh, there's um, latency issues associated with it. There's the release of control where vPaid basically owns the playback all of a sudden. Uh, and all of these issues we have addressed in the design of OM, OM for web. Um, and OM for web is basically not actively taking the playback. The, there's, no, there's no dependency of a playback on Omid for web. Uh, so overall, much better experience. Um, so we expect a, both transition of a, websites and a, uh, ad delivery platforms from vPay to Ahmed Web, and as well as new publishers, new websites that were never measurable for viewability, 
on their video uh, inventory will now be able to be measured because they will feel more comfortable implementing OM for web video. Um, so, you know, that's that's a bit about OM for web, really exciting release. Uh, you should definitely put it on your website and uh, enable measurement. Um, the next section will deal with the kind of technical aspects of uh, OM for web. Thank you. Great, and we will go ahead and move right on over to the technical integration overview. Um, and that's going to be uh, Nick Chavez from Google um, sharing, sharing that overview with us. Hello everyone, my name is Nick Chavez and I'm a software engineer at Google. And for the past year or two, I've been working on developing the OM SDK for web. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through a sample integration with the SDK based off of the reference app, which you can find and is publicly available on the IAB's GitHub page. So here in the JS client's repo, you should find a subfolder called the reference app for web. And inside there are a few instructions for setting this app up and getting started. For those of you who are not familiar with it, I'll just run the app very quickly right now. And so this is the main page where you can change a few settings. I'll get into this later, but for now let's just go to the main event. So you see the video ad here, and when I click start, you'll be able to do all the things I mentioned before, like pause, change the volume, etc., and even change some of the clipping to test the viewability. Well, I would like to show you what it would be like to add the OM SDK for web to your web setter app. So to that end, what I'm going to do today is take the reference app that we just saw and strip out all the integration code and walk you through step by step what the code changes needed would be. Okay, and then the next thing I've done is that I've already opened the folder in my IDE. And I'll go ahead and open the reference app web folder and open up the readme. Alright, so just following along with these instructions here, I'm going to run npm install. Okay, so that may have taken a while, but when it's done, we'll now proceed to the next step. Uh, which is to acquire the OM SDK for web binaries off the tech lab portal and copy them into the static folder. Let's go back to the instructions. So it's to copy the OM web, i.e. the service script, as well as the validation script into the static folder. So let's go to the desktop. And I'll run those copies now. Okay, and then the last one is the domain loader. So that's going into static slash dot well known slash omid. So a little different. Okay, and then the next instruction is to run npm run start. And I've already showed that to you guys. It's what I was just running earlier. So I'll skip that now. Okay, so to start, we're going to go to the OMSDK manager file, which is in source OMSDK manager. And this class right now manages basically the whole OMSDK integration. There's a few other things here related to taking in the settings that I showed you earlier and compatibility with browsers, but this really is the meat and potatoes. So I'll go ahead and delete this and we'll start from scratch. So just for context here, the reference app uses the Clojure compiler. So we'll be able to use things like classes and exports and not really worry about browser compatibility because the Clojure compiler uh, will take care of it and make sure everything's ES5 compatible. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to declare the OMSDK manager class and we're going to export this class so that it can be used elsewhere. So in my constructor, I'm going to take in a few parameters, the settings. So these are the things that I was showing you earlier in the root of the test app, as well as the video element that we're going to be measuring. I'm going to store these in two member variables. And then I'm going to create a few other ones for storing some OMSDK objects. So our add session, the add events object, and the media events object. So these are null for now, but just to make sure we have access to these types provided by the OMSDK session client, I'm going to go ahead and import these at the top of my file here. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is create an iframe for the OMSDK to live in. Now, it's important to create an iframe for the OMSDK so that the OMSDK for web that you're creating doesn't interfere with other OMSDKs that might be present on your page, perhaps in other iframes for different ad slots. The iframe provides a degree of isolation for namespacing, but it is not 
a secure iframe because the OMS decay for web needs to be able to measure the creative. So for now, I'm just going to assume that there is this function called create OMS decay iframe uh, and it'll make an iframe for me and I'll just store it in this property for now. So let me go ahead and just declare that function. This is going to create a friendly iframe in which the OMS decay will run. And while I'm here, I'll just fill out the implementation for this. But basically, we're going to create an iframe, uh, set the sandboxing such that It'll be friendly to the page that we're on, to the creative. I'm going to hide it, make it invisible, because there's nothing that needs to be displayed in this iframe. And then the last important step is that I'll make it so that the contents of the iframe is the following HTML snippet. And so, as you can see, what this iframe will contain is just a script that points to the OMSDK URL. And again, this URL is coming from the settings that are generated by that front page that I showed you earlier. And specifically, that settings page is pointing to the file that we downloaded earlier today that's in the static folder. When I run the app, there's a little HTTP server that starts with Node, and it's hosting the OMSDK file, so this URL is something like localhost slash omwebv1.js. In your own website or app, this URL will point to your own copy of the OMSDK for web that you're hosting. So it might look something like mycdn.com slash omwebv1.js. Okay, so now that we've created the iframe, we actually need to attach it to the page and load it. And then once it loads, we're going to want to do some other things. So we know when that happens, we're going to add an event listener for the load event. And we're going to call this function that doesn't exist yet. I'll write it right now, and then we'll fill it in in a bit. All right, and then we'll just attach to the page as so. It'll be right on the body. Again, not important where it is as long as it's on the DOM since it won't be displaying anything. Okay, so now let's fill out what we want to do once the iframe has loaded. So let's add a quick comment here. And then what we'll do is go ahead and create that add session object. And <laughs> I'll defer this again to another method we're going to write in a bit. So let's just write that here, and I'll get back to that later. So we're going to create our add session. We're then going to declare that our session is a video type. So we're going to call the set creative type method, like so. And actually, I'll need this creative type enum, so I'll go ahead and import that now as well. Okay, so that's in the constants module. So I'll destructure and import. All right, now it should work great. For the next step, I want to create my add events object. So I'll create a new object like so, passing in my add session. And then likewise for the media events object, in the same way. Finally, what I'll do now is I'll start the add session to start tracking the add. So if you've done an app integration with the OMS key before, you'll notice that add session creation is mostly the same but a little different. You'll still need the add events object and the media events object in order to send events like impression and quartiles and things like that. One interesting difference here is that we're now starting the add session in JavaScript, not in Java, not in Objective-C. Remember, we're on the web. Okay, so let's now go ahead and fill out create add session. So I'll add again a helpful comment here. And the first thing I want to do is create the partner object. So this should be familiar to you, again, if you've worked with OMS to K for apps. So the first parameter is the partner name and the partner version. And these are constants that I'm going to import now. I'm importing these constants from another file in this reference app project. So they're not something that comes with the OMS to K. They're in this file here called constants.js. And for the reference app, that's the name. And the version is a debug test version. Obviously, in your own website or app, these would be the names that you've registered at the IAB Tech Lab Tools portal. For the next step, I'll be creating a verification script resource to represent the verification script that's going to run for this add session. So the properties for this object are coming from the settings page that I showed you earlier when I ran the reference app. So they're coming from this object with which the OMSDK manager was constructed. Note that the four parameters here are the verification script URL, the vendor key, the verification parameters, all which are the same as OMSDK for apps, 
with the new addition of an access mode parameter. So I'll defer this to another method again, but it's going to essentially be called pulling this access mode from the settings. To be able to use the verification script resource type, I'll have to import that as well. I'll also have to import the partner type as well. So let's go ahead and do that now before I forget. The next thing that we'll need is the content URL of the website. So again, that's coming from the settings object. So we'll just take that as a given in your own app. This may come from any other source, but it should be a URL that describes the page, perhaps more precisely than the actual page URL, if possible. If not, just providing the actual page URL via document.location.href is perfectly fine. This next piece of data is totally optional, but just for completeness, I'll show it to you. So you can provide a custom reference data, just like a native app, if you need to pass information from the integration to the script. And then finally, once we have all this data, we're going to create the omid context object. So this will take in the partner, an array of verification script resources. We have just the one now, the content URL, and the custom reference data. And again, I'll need that context type, so let's go ahead and import it now before I forget. Now I just need to set two more things in my context, and I should be all set. Since I'm using this setup for testing, I should go ahead and set context.underEvaluation equal to true, so that verification scripts know not to report this as legitimate global traffic. And then finally, I'll let the context know what the video element it should measure is by calling set video element and passing in our video element here. So the last thing I need to do here is let the context know where the OMS decay is. And like I said earlier, we're loading it in that iframe that we created. So I'll grab that in a new variable service window from the iframe. I'll quickly add a sanity check just to make sure that it's defined and it's not null. And then I'll call the context.setService window method so that the context is now pointing to the OMSDK for web. And now, finally, I can actually create the ad session like so. And return it. So that it can be used by OMSDK iframe did load. Okay, so let's go ahead and fill out get OMID access mode. So this method really isn't that interesting, so I'm just going to copy paste what the actual implementation is. And I'll quickly describe it. So basically, in the verification settings object that I was talking about earlier, that'll, be, that'll contain the access mode that we're going to use for this session. And so it really is just a question of translating the constants that I'm using here in constants.js over here and translating them to the access modes uh, used by the OMID API. And so just to show you that, I'll go ahead and import that module now from the OMSDK. So here it is, I'm, implement, I'm importing access mode from the OMID constants module, and that'll just translate my constants into OMID's constants. The one interesting thing about this method you'll see is that when I select creative or full in the reference app dropdown, those both, those both result in the OMID access mode full. The reason for that is there is no OMID access mode dot creative. Rather, creative access mode is running full access mode where that add is isolated from the rest of the page. Right, so the last piece of the puzzle now is to actually track the video itself and tell the OMSDK all about it. So we're going to be tracking a few video events. So let's go ahead and create a constant to store all the event types that we're going to be following. So the first one we're interested in is an error for the video event, followed by the loaded data event, which will tell us when the video has loaded enough to start playback. We're interested in pause, we're interested in play, we're interested in time updates, and we're interested in the volume changes. You can, of course, read more about these events on the MDN website or any HTML reference. Okay, so now to listen to these events, we'll just add a snippet here at the end of our constructor. So for each event type, we're going to add an event listener for that event type which points to a method that, uh, as you guessed it, does not exist yet. Alright, so while we're here, let's just go flesh out that event handler. 
So video element did dispatch event and we'll handle it here. So just as a sanity check, in case the video starts firing events before everything's ready, let's quickly return if the add session or any of the objects we need to report aren't ready yet. After that, let's actually handle each event case by case with a switch statement. So in the case of the first one, error, we'll be doing the following. We'll be calling this dot add session dot error with a video error type and to describe the error itself we'll just pull that data from the video element as so. For the next kind of event a loaded data that indicates to us that the video has buffered enough media to start playback. So the method we should call here is this dot add events dot loaded and pass in vast properties since this is a video add. Alright, well let's go ahead and make the vast properties. That's another object that we'll need. So this type is also coming from the OMSDK, so let's go ahead and import that at once. And I almost forgot, we'll also need to import the error type type as well. Okay, so let's fill in some of the data here. So whether this ad is skippable, it's false. There's no skip offset, so it's zero. It's not an autoplay, you have to click to start. And it's a pre-roll. Again, you should all be familiar with this if you've used the OMSDK for apps. This API, the error API are exactly the same. Okay, let's move on to the next event. Uh, I believe it is pause. And so when a pause happens, we want to call this dot media events dot pause. Real simple. When play happens, we actually have to check something. So the HTML video element will fire play when it first starts, and also at any other time when the user has paused it and then resumed it. Now in this case we're only interested in calling this dot media events dot resume when the video has actually resumed, not when it started for the first time. So to make sure that we don't do that, we're gonna add a simple check if this dot video element dot current time is greater than zero, then we must have already started playback must be in the middle somewhere, so we'll be okay to call resume in this case. The next event we're interested in is time update. And this one will actually be a little bit more complicated, so let's go ahead and defer this to another method which I'll create later. Video element to dispatch time update. Finally, let's handle the last case, which is volume change. And this one is also slightly tricky. To get the volume, we'll see if the video element is muted or not. And if it is, we'll pretend we have a zero volume. Otherwise, we'll just get the volume directly. And then we'll report this via media events dot volume change. And just for completeness, we'll uh, add a little default block that does nothing. Okay, and last but not least, we'll actually start filling out this did dispatch time update event. So I'll quickly describe what the method does. It handles a time update event from the video element, and I'll add a quick sanity check just to return quickly if none of the objects we need are ready or the video element is in fact not playing. So in this method, what I want to do is report quartile events like started, midpoint, first quartile, third quartile, complete. So to do that, I'll need to know what percentage of the video is completed. To do that, I'll divide the video element's current time by its duration, and then I'll add some if statements to figure out what threshold of the video I've crossed. Now to do that, I actually need to know what the last video time update was, so that I know if I've crossed the 25% boundary or the 50% boundary, 75% boundary, etc. So I'll need a new property for that. I'll add it here in the constructor where it belongs. And let's call this last video time. So this will be the last observed current time of the video element. For now, let's set it to negative one, just so that it won't match with anything else. All right, so to check whether I've passed the 0% threshold, 
I'll add this simple if statement. So if my last video time was less than zero, it starts at negative one, remember, and my current time is greater than or equal to zero, then I must have crossed the zero percent threshold and be displaying my first frame. So when this happens, I'll call add events dot impression occurred. And this is because I'm using the begin to render impression type. And I'll also call this dot media events dot start to indicate video start. And so this method, again, just like apps, if you're familiar with it, takes in the duration of the video element as well as its initial volume. So actually that reminds me, I should probably declare what my impression type is since I'm using this methodology. So I'll quickly scroll back up to the, this part and I'll add this.addSession.setImpressionType to impression type dot begin to render and naturally I need to import that type as well okay so let's continue here all right so I've handled the case where we're crossing the zero percent threshold now let's handle the case where I'm crossing the 25 percent threshold so this will be when the last video time is less than 25 percent but the current video time is greater than that or equal to that. And for this, I'll call media events dot first quartile. Again, this is just the same as OMS oh, for apps. And so on and so forth for midpoint and third quartile. And finally, for the video's completion. Okay, so this is the basic implementation of this method. And just so our last video time is updated correctly, I'll have to do that here at the bottom. Okay, so now this should all work correctly. The last thing I want to do is that I want to finish the ad session once the ad is completed. So just to give the verification script some time before I close the session to fire off any remaining pings for reporting, I'll do this in a set timeout a little bit later, say three seconds later. So in this little closure, I'll call this dot add session dot finish. And I'll set this to happen 3000 milliseconds in the future after the ad is completed. And 3000 is about the standard time you want to wait before you call finish. Otherwise reporting might not catch that last ping for completion. Cool, so that's all the code in OMSDK Manager, and it should be all the code that you will write in your own integration of the OMSDK for web. So let's go ahead and take a look at the finished product. I'm back in the reference app web folder, and all we should need to do is run npm start. It's compiling. It's compiling, and great, it's already ready for us to take a look at. So let's go back to localhost 8080. All right, and so, now that we're here, I'll walk through what the settings are. This is going to be the URL that we're going to use to load the verification script that you saw in the verification settings object. Uh, and again, we're loading it from the local server that's running. It's going to be this validation script that we downloaded from the IAB earlier. Recall, it's right here in this static folder. All right, uh, the other values here are the vendor key. This is just hard-coded for testing, uh, values that I've placed here, for instance. Uh, and then here you can select the access mode in the reference app. And again, that's going to go through the whole get, ac get omit access mode method that I was describing earlier. This is just the URL for the media file. And then this is the omistk for web URL. Again, it's that omwebv1.js we downloaded earlier and is now in the static folder and is coming through right in this section over here. Okay, so let's go ahead and test creative mode. Before we do so, I'm going to open up the browser's console so that we can see all the network requests that'll be going out. Remember, with the validation script, we should be seeing a uh, payload for each event that's occurring that the verification script receives. And, you know, for just to be a little bit easier on the eyes, we can also see that in the console. So let's go ahead and open that and start. Okay, so immediately we see a dump of data. Uh, Right here in the network log, we see that all the 
stuff we needed was loaded, so in addition to the page itself, the OM for web itself was loaded, that's good. We have the verification script that was loaded, that's good, that means a session must have started. And then here are the uh, debug messages sent by the validation script. So while we can go through these, I think it'll be much easier to just take this JSON that's outputted here, format that, and take a look. So let's go take a look at the first message that's outputted here. Uh, and just to make this a little bit easier to read, we're going to save this in a scratch JSON file so we can format it a little bit easier. Okay, so let's go ahead and format that. All right, so this is the first event. It's a session start type event. That's correct. Perfect. That should always be the first event. And let's go ahead and inspect the context next. Right, that's correct. Again, creative access mode, which we select in the drop down, is just full access mode confined in a isolated iframe. So that's correct. You've got the web environment. We're in an implementation done by the OMSDK, by the IAB. That's correct. Our partner name and partner version that I pointed out to you earlier, which was in our constants file here, has also made it. That's correct. The add such type is HTML, it's all correct. Our custom reference data that we provided here has also made it through. Recall that this is provided right over here and then subsequently in the context creation. Great. We've also verified that under evaluation is also true, which we've also set again back here. Finally, we have the last few bits of data we set, like the impression type. Again, it was begin to render and creative type, which we set to video. Recall that was done on these two lines. That's great. And look at constant URL. It's also been provided, which we set back over here. Last but not least, the verification parameters that we set on the test pages have also come through. One interesting thing to note here is that page URL is null. Indeed, it, is, it should be null because we've isolated the creative from the top window of the page. So the OMSDK is not actually able to determine the top page URL itself. In those instances, instead of reporting something that is not totally credible, it will report null. So this is actually correct for creative access mode. Okay, great. Let's take a look at the other events. Let's see. So already we have, okay, that was the first one we looked at. Then we have a geometry change here. Let's go take a look at this. Uh, again, let's paste this and reformat. Okay. So our add view is 100% in view. Everything looks good here generally. The width and the height look sane. And that's correct. Yeah. Our ad is totally in view, so there should be no issue there. All right, we have another event here. The next one is for loaded, which should have occurred when the media loaded. Let's go ahead and analyze that. Okay, great. So all the data that we that is collected here, skippable autoplay position, is exactly the data that we provided when we called loaded. So not skippable, the skip is offset to zero. It's not autoplay, it's a pre-roll. And you can see that's all here. As well as a creative type and impression type that we specified earlier. Great, all right, let's look at the next event. So there's a few more geometry changes here, it looks like, uh, but nothing that's different. It looks like it's still 100. Okay, so let's just clear this out to keep this clean, and let's go ahead and start the video. Okay, so I'm just pause there, and already have a few. So we have the imp impression event. Let's go ahead and analyze that more closely. So the geometry is still 100% in view, and that's correct because my ad is still 100% in view. The geometry still looks correct and sane. And the metadata, again, that we reported earlier is still there. Okay, impression looks great. And it fired at the right time, right? The video started playing. That's what I intended. I had the impression fire on crossing the 0% quartile. All right, let's look at the next event. Looks like a start. Right, so duration of the media's report is 30 seconds. That's correct. The media volume is 1, also correct. Notice here that device volume is null, which is interesting. Uh, and that is as intended because on the web, we're not able to detect the device volume. That is only possible on iOS and Android. All right, and then lastly, we have the pause event, which is expected since we paused the video. Again, not too interesting. Just the type, there's no additional data on this event. Okay, so let's resume. Great, so we have a new resume event. So let's go back and, well, there's actually not much to see. We can see from here that everything makes sense. So I think we may have an issue here because we're not seeing any quartile events like first quartile, midpoint, third quartile, etc. I'm not sure why, but my guess is there's a bug in the code we just wrote. So let's go back and take a look and see what went wrong. So I think the issue must be the following. Current video time is a float from 0 to 1 percentage and we're treating it as such. 
but we're also treating last video time like that. The issue is that we're not normalizing last video time before we set it, so we should just set it to current video time. And I think this should be fixed. One other bug here is that I copy pasted too eagerly, and this should be 0.75 for the third quartile, not 0.25. So now everything should be working. Let's go back and refresh the page. And I'll just clear out the initial events that we already looked at. And I'll clear out impression start. And we should be expecting first quartile to hit in just about a few seconds. And there it is. So that's first quartile. I'm not going to paste it out just because there's no additional data. Just the usual ID timestamp and type. Likewise for midpoint. And in a few seconds we should see the third quartile. Fantastic. And then finally we'll be expecting the complete event followed by the session finish three seconds after that as we had timed out in our code. So great, we get a complete event, we get a pause, because playback is paused, and we get a session finish a few seconds after. Great, fantastic. So it looks like everything in that respect is working as intended. All right, so that's pretty much all there is to show here. If you'd like to continue to play around with the reference app, I encourage you to do so. Again, it's on the IAB's GitHub page. And I encourage you to test your own verification script URLs if you're a verification vendor. Well, this marks the end of the demo, and I hope you've learned a lot about how to integrate the OMSDK for Web and TR apps. Great, um, and then we are going to move on um, to the access modes. So as you saw in the demo, there were a few different options for access modes, and Jack and John are going to walk us through um, what those are. Uh, hello. I'm John Satterfield with Oracle Data Cloud Note. I'm a software manager, and I'm here to talk about access mode. Hi, I'm Jack Wellborn, a video engineer at Integral Ad Science, also here to talk about access modes. So let's get started. Access modes determine what measurement provider scripts have access to. In Open Measurement for Web Video, this access is controlled using sandbox iframes. As such, all access modes include or support some form of sandboxing. It is because of these sandboxes that opting in to provide content URL is recommended for all implementers who want to support brand safety measurement. Open measurement for web video has three access modes, creative access, limited access, and domain access. Consulting with your advertisers and measurement providers is strongly recommended as the requirements for valid measurement differs with each access mode. Creative access mode writes a given measurement provider's verification script to a context that is friendly to the creative. Open measurement for in-app refers to this as full access because it typically provides complete access to a given web view. We use the term creative access in open measurement for web video because it only provides verification scripts with access to the creative, which are typically running in an iframe. Creative access requires the least amount of effort for measurement providers to validate, even when the creative is sandboxed, since they have the ability to independently verify measurement at impression time, all while still getting the benefit of open measurement signals. Limited access mode in open measurement for web writes a given measurement provider's verification script to an iframe that is sandboxed and completely isolated from the creative. Due to the nature of how sandboxed iframes work, measurement providers cannot independently verify either the measurement data or the identity of the publisher and relies solely on the open measurement SDK for those signals. There is also no way for measurement providers to attest that the data being sent to their sandbox is actually coming from the open measurement SDK. Because there is no means to independently verify measurement, the SDK or even the publishers, measurement providers may not consider impressions valid for limited access mode. With open measurement for web video, the alternative is domain access mode. It is based on limited access mode. The difference is that the sandboxed iframe loads a standardized file hosted on a given publisher's domain with headers that limit that file to the domain.
The standardized file will then be used by the SDK to load a specified verification script that can easily attest the publisher's identity. Discrepancies or anomalous behavior can then be traced using the, the, that identity. The implementation of domain access should be validated by the IB. Domain access requires significantly more effort to validate and accredit measurement data when compared to creative access. Measurement vendors will have to thoroughly test open measurement data being sent from a given integrator and or publisher. Domain access validation is a simple set of tests that validate a publisher's implementation of the OM loader used by the open measurement SDK. The tests validate the OM loader is hosted at the proper location with the correct contents and is served with headers that prevent the file from being loaded on another domain. Each validation is performed at the subdomain level. This validation is crucial to preventing domain spoofing and also helps measurement providers get accreditation for domain access implementations. Great, and then I'm going to take us quickly through, um, as you heard in the, the last uh, piece from Jack, the, the domain access validation, if you choose that method, um, that is actually something that has some uh, additional validation requirements. So if as a publisher you decide to implement in um, domain access mode, there is this additional registration. You can register with IAB Tech Lab for that uh, domain access validation. You can do so in our tools portal. So that is available now. You'll see a tile that has OM Web Video Domain Access Validation. Um, once you're there, you're able to register each domain or subdomain along with the partner name through which you're accessing OM SDK. Um, and, and you're able to sign up to kind of uh, to receive that weekly validation. And so what we'll be doing is, is checking to make sure that that OM loader file uh, is installed correctly, um, and then reporting that information back to uh, a public API in which the verification providers can actually um, check to confirm which domains are, uh, are certified or validated for that domain access mode. And that's really just as uh, Jack said, to help with that additional layer, layer of security um, to, to help attest that these signals are, are coming from where they say they're coming from. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jarrett to talk through the compliance program. Hi, everyone. I'm Jarrett Old, Director of the Compliance Programs at the Tech Lab. Today, I'm going to discuss how the compliance process works for OM Web's video certification and the testing requirements for, uh, for certifications as well. Uh, the compliance program is offered by the Tech Lab as a voluntary paid service to validate the proper implementation of OM Web video integrations. Completing the compliance program verifies that the correct OMS, it, OM SDK signals, event signals are set when the video ad is shown. It also validates that the integration will work with measurement providers verification tags. You may submit for certification once you've fully integrated OM SDK into your web a video player and have completed your internal testing. So how the process works. So the first step is the onboarding process. Uh, this process involves signing up for OM Web Video Compliance Program and completing the onboarding guide. The onboarding guide should include the details of your integration, how to test the ads, what access mode or access modes you're testing for, how uh, you're certifying for, and provide a, a URL to the a URL or a page to the compliance team and access for testing. Also, as part of the onboarding process, the compliance team will provide a, a validation verification JavaScript tag specifically for testing uh, for, for compliance. So when you're going through the compliance process, we will provide the, uh, the tag uh, specifically for, um, for, for, for you to test with. Please note the compliance team does not test verification tags for measurement providers. These tests are conducted independently by each measurement provider and is outside the scope of compliance. So once the URL is ready, the compliance team can begin testing and validating the integration against all the web video test cases. If any issues are found during testing, we'll provide feedback for what needs to be fixed and validate again once it's ready. This is an iterative process and the compliance team will work with you to remediate all issues until satisfactory. 
once all the issues are fixed and all the test cases are satisfied, the tech, the tech lab will issue your certification. So this is not a pass or fail. We will iterate with you until all, re, all issues are resolved. This, once certified, this, we will send a, a certificate containing the details of the video player or the SDK being certified, a detailed reports of the testing results, and the tech lab seal of approval. We will also provide you with a we will also add you to the list of compliant companies on our website. The time for certification is typically three to four weeks, depending on what issues are found during testing and how many iterations are needed. Again, this is not pass fail and we will work with you to every, uh, everything satisfactory. Um, so if there were no issues, then it could take, uh, it could take a, a shorter time. If there are a lot of issues, it could take, uh, it could take longer. Again, it's about three to four weeks from uh, start to finish on average. Our compliance guide has been updated to include a section on web video certification and details of steps for, for submitting. So it's a lot more detail what I'm providing here. So please take a look at the uh, the guide. We've also we've also added a uh, a test case document that outs that outlines um, all the all the web video sp uh, specific test cases and what the expected results are. Uh, please make sure this test page that, that you provide with the video player. Uh, has all of the um, has gone through all of the uh, test cases and the use cases uh, before submitting, and verify that all the results are correct. Uh, uh, and for validating your integration, you can use Charles Proxy, Fiddler, or some other web proxy tool. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the, the test cases that are actually in this document. Um, this is just a sample set of what we look for for certification when going through compliance. Um, so if you saw from um, the next demo, uh, the, the, these are signals that were being, being sent uh, by the video player. Um, so all, all ad sessions need to start and finish. Uh, the ad session type is gonna be uh, HTML since we're certifying for uh, HTML video. Your creative type will be video. Uh, we look for the impression type, viewable, uh, to begin to render. Uh, the partner name, which is important because that identifies your integration, what's being certified. Uh, and then the on-screen geometry, uh, how the video interacts with, uh, with scrolling or how, it's, how the ad is, um, is presented on the screen. And for video, of course, volume changes, uh, the media player volume and the device volume, and these are independent of each other. Uh, and then the, uh, the video uh, the video interaction and the events, the core tiles, complete events, pause and resume. And again, these are just a, a sample of the test cases and the events that we look for for certification. And these are all, again, these are all in the, uh, um, sorry, in, in the test use case doc on our website. So there are many questions on the compliance program or the testing requirements, feel free to reach out to compliance at iebtechlab.com. Uh, for technical support or integration questions, please email us at lmsdksupport at iebtechlab.com. Thank you. Thank you, Jarrett. Um, I know we are uh, just at time um, or just a little bit over in fact, uh, but I did want to just see if, uh, give folks a chance if you're still on, if you have any questions. We've been trying to watch the, the chat in the Q&A box and I haven't seen anything come in, um, but we will, if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop those into the chat now. Um, or the other option is, as Jarrett mentioned, you can email um, for technical support, um, OMSDK support at iebtechlab.com. Um, hi, Jill, this is Shelley. Uh, while we wait for questions, I just had a little bit more commentary on the access modes. Um, so like you saw, there were three access modes, uh, creative, domain access, and limited. Uh, I just wanted to add like uh, uh, the creative access mode is actually uh, takes you much further than the VPAID already. It already provides uh, publishers with the, uh, with the security and, and control uh, that is not available with VPAID uh, because it doesn't control your uh, 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 video player and allows verification providers to fully confirm and perform their verification um, uh, completely. And then of course, uh, domain access, like uh, was explained is kind of a hybrid. It allows you some, um, uh, to have some limitation uh, on what kind of access um, a verification providers have uh, to your uh, player and allows you to prove, uh, you know, at least the, the identity of the 
uh, domain on which the ad is being played and, and limited uh, like because it's completely um, uh, shut off from any access for verification providers. Uh, uh, they may not consider it valid and you may have to work individually with each uh, verification provider if you choose to operate in that mode. Yeah, just basically I wanted to stress that creative already is a, a step ahead from the VPAID environment. Thank you, Shaley. I do not see any questions, so um, uh, I think we can wrap it up for today. But again, if you guys do have questions as you're going through the integration um, or reviewing the documents, feel free to email us at omsdksupport at iabtechlab.com. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you to the uh, presenters uh, for your time. Uh, appreciate it. Bye.